So it was interesting um, listening to Marcus de Soto um, on, on, uh, on Wednesday, um, sorry, Thursday, when he was talking about number and pattern recognition, and he put the charts up with the balls on the, and the patterns on the lottery tickets, and it, it reminded me of probably what we're trying to do as technicians um, outside of the mechanical studies and, and quantitative side. And certainly as an elliotician, um, that's exactly what I'm looking to do. Um, it was devised on the market, a pattern that is a repetition of human nature, um, as, as some of you know. So I wasn't sure where to pitch this. Some of you may not know Elliott Wave at all. Some of you will probably know it relatively well, um, and there will be some doubters out there. So I'll do a little bit of an introduction around um, Elliott Wave and um, then move into probably a few examples and walkthroughs and some of the pitfalls and maybe hopefully help you um, use it successfully going forward. So uh, up here I've got a list which is meant to be a little bit more, um, more uh, split out, but um, to start with the doubts, Elliott Wave is too subjective. It is. Um, and if I've just cited on the naysayers there, it is subjective, and I'm going to go through why and how to stop being quite so subjective. I think there's, Elliott Wave is one of these things that goes through cycles where um, it's in favour and it's not. And I think there's a lot of people in the market that come in, do a little bit of Elliott Wave, throw a lot of rubbish out um, through websites, Twitter, which um, is a favourite these days, and it gets a bad reputation when it goes wrong. Um, so I have a particular way of filtering um, Elliott Wave, and we'll go through that a little bit later. Um, Analysts show too many alternative scenarios in Elliott Wave, up, down, sideways, and can flip views aggressively. So if you're a trader, it doesn't really matter. It's your money, it's your P&L. If you get it wrong and you want to flip your position, you only have yourself to answer to. But as, if you're a strategist, I would be very wary, which I did for 10 years at, at JP Morgan and in various roles before that. Um, I would be very wary of that process. Be mindful of your wave count and that, that rule of if you flip back through a level, it's going to flip that, that view. So don't, don't put such an aggressive view out if you're in that process where it isn't absolutely clear what is going through the market. So I, I, again, I think that will come, become a little bit clearer as we go through some of the examples. And it's only good in hindsight, which was one that was thrown at me by, by Deborah um, quite directly. And I think um, it, it isn't if it's used properly. It's very easy to go back and look at what the Elliott wave count was. Um, but what we're trying to do is go back, look at what the Elliott wave count is up to then, and know what we should be expecting it to do going forward. And again, hopefully I will, I will clear that question up as we go through. So then I thought, I'll give you some tips straight off the bat. If you're going to use Elliott Wave or you do use Elliott Wave, don't be too clever with it. We interviewed a, uh, uh, an Elliottitian analyst back in uh, the early 2000s, and he came in, sat opposite us in the new normal interview process, and we said, well, what do you think of Euro dollar? I think it was. And he said, oh, I think it's going to do this and this and this. And I said, oh, OK. Why, why isn't it just an ABC corrective process? Ah, he said, I can see why you think that. But I like to be a little bit more clever with my wave counts. It's not a thing to be clever with. It is a tool for making money, as I say at the bottom. Um, it is what it is. Just use it in its sense. Use the rules and don't break the rules, which is the third tip in there. I do see a lot of Elliott Wave out there that has a view, and it's broken some quite basic rules. And you challenge the trader or analyst when they come up and say, I think this. And they say, oh, well, it only broke a little bit. Well, it probably is wrong, and there is a reason for that. It might not be wrong right then, but it will be wrong somewhere down the line. I would be very careful of intraday and micro wave counting. Um, especially in foreign exchange, it can work a little bit, um, as in for a, a day or so, but there are too many factors in the markets now that can drive that wave count away, and your probability of being right 
reduces greatly the shorter the time frame you go. A central bulb comes in and intervenes, an M&A flow comes in, it can be anything, and it can throw you out significantly, especially on an intraday process. And we have the world of wonderful uh, computer trading in, in stocks and stock indices, which throw things out a little bit. So I tend to find that Elliott Wave works its very best on a consistent basis in foreign exchange, perhaps because there, it's not such um, an intellectual part of the market, if you like. Bond markets, you know where interest rates are going. You have so-called forward guidance, or lack of at the moment, um, from, the, from the central banks. But you generally have a path that you know that interest rates are going to. Foreign exchange, it will graduate with rate spreads along that path, but you have all these other areas of, as I say, central bank intervention, M&A flow, um, speculative flow that can move it around a little bit freer and capture some of that psychology that's going on in the markets. And I think one of the poorer ones now as well, on a, on a shorter term basis, is, is, is the S&P, because there are so many computers trading it. But it doesn't mean it doesn't work in that time frame. You just need to be mindful of what you're trying to achieve in there. Um, I would also be very careful, and this, if there's one thing I want you to take away today, is of looking at one market in isolation with a wave count. Um, and I will just answer that question through the, through the presentation. Um, and a little tip, if you are trying Elliott Wave and you can't quite tell, is this a five wave, isn't this a five wave? One of the things I, somebody gave me a tip of when I was younger um, was count it backwards. So five, four, can you three, three, two, one, and, and see if it works that way through. So I think I've caught up. So, and one of my little pet hates in terms of the technical world, it can get very academic. And I listen to, to conversations and it did this and it did that and it only did a little bit. And it, it's, for me, it is a tool for making money. Um, we've got the presentation shooting off on its own again. Um, it's a tool for making money. And it's your edge on the market. Um, and I think you should keep that very much in mind, especially if you're a, a, a trader in the markets. Um, so I seem to have lost my, my presentation a little bit here. For me, the way I use Elliott Wave, it gives me a roadmap. It's the only system that I know in the world, pretty much, that gives you an age of trend. And what we're trying to do is define where we should be aggressively getting into a position and where we should be starting to take off uh, our risk in that process. And Elliott Wave is one of the few that, that gives you that roadmap and tells you where you are and how far in a probability sense of where you're going. So for me, my filtering process in, in Elliott Wave um, is looking across all asset classes. It's a lot of work, um, but I get a, a broader picture of where everything is and where, it's, where it is within its wave count across FX, fixed income, equities, and commodities. And I'm looking for pockets of correlation across them. Now, not, they don't necessarily have to be correlated markets them, themselves, but a correlation across there where the wave count is suggesting the same thing going forward. And it's increasing my probability that that wave count is going to be right. So to give you an example, um, filtering in all of its senses is the key for me to being successful with Elliott Wave. So why do you need to filter? So here's an example of a quite recent process. And I'm sorry at the back. I did stand at the back, and I'm not sure whether you can see. But I'm going to have to use the, the pointer for these. We've, we've got two bond markets, highly correlated generally. Um, almost identical structures going through. Sideways consolidation, sideways consolidation. Broke up, set back, broke up, set back, broke away, broke away. They should be roughly the same. The Elliott Wave structure is the same. We now know what they did. The one on the left is Buns, and the one on the right is T-Notes. And they have done two completely different things. And this one has broken to new lows. And well, it remains to be seen, but this one hasn't broken to new lows yet. And I don't think there's anybody in the world that thinks that t 10 years are going to go to new lows at this moment in time. So what is it, and how can we differentiate between these two charts? with Elliott Wave, and I will go through that in the presentation. 
So how you filter your Elliott wave is down to you. Are you a day trader, long-term investor, hedger, swing trader? It's very difficult to try and fit all of this into 50 minutes. It's a subject that probably takes a week, if not two weeks, to go through solidly. But whichever you use, it's going to be a little bit different. But you do need to filter um, for your Elliott wave. Now, I have a friend who's deeply into fundamentals and does it exceptionally well. And then he uses Elliott wave for the last 20% of timing and confirming his view on, on the markets. And it works exceptionally well for him. I'm the other way around. I'm probably 80% price action in Elliott wave. And I have probably five, six filters that work around it, technical filters. And then I'm always mindful of what the backdrop is in terms of, of, of the fundamental picture. So that's the challenge for you, is, is being able to filter it. So I'll go through how I do it. As I said, across all markets, top-down analysis. I'm trying to get a big picture of where I think the indices, the, the, the broader dollar um, country analysis is, is going. And then I'm looking at bottom up. I think this area is going to outperform. I think the best place to spend risk will be equities, will be foreign exchange. And then I can go into those markets and deeply analyze each of those markets and look at it bottom up and decide where is my risk reward opportunity in these markets. More than anything else in Elliott Wave, does it make sense? Um, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh, I've got a little wave one here and a wave two. I think we could have a wave three breaking out, um, and I can have my stop there. And that's 10 minutes before payrolls and the payroll number comes out, it will change that wave count, without a doubt. You will either be exceptionally right or exceptionally wrong very, very quickly. Um, does it make sense in the sense of a broader picture? So to give you an example, I remember reading um, a number of years ago when cable was going through two the, first, the second time. Um, and we were trading around 205, 210. And I saw some weird and wonderful wave counts looking for 250, 260, three. And there's just no way the UK government is going to let the currency go to that level, um, akin to any other foreign exchange if it gets too far. So for me, again, as an explanation of that around the markets, Ralph Nelson Elliott designed it on the, on the equity markets. So it was always perpetually going higher for him. But other markets don't do that. And I'll address that, that question that David Stedden threw at me yesterday. Um, so in the background, for those that don't know anything about Elliott Wave, I have a structure of Elliott Wave that's playing out on the screen. If you think of the white chart that's playing out as, say, an hourly or a 360-minute chart, I tend to use 360-minute charts um, just because they're the time zones through the day for me. Um, the red chart that will be coming up is a daily chart, and then the yellow line will be the weekly. So you can see how you get five waves up, three back, five up, three back, five up, three back completes an, a broader wave one up, two back, three up, and then you can build the structure out. So those familiar with Elliott Wave will be more than familiar with this. So in the backdrop of this, we look a little bit like that. So there's a, a clear example. It's quite an old chart, but it worked. Um, a clear wave one up, two back, can be very deep. There's no real hard and fast rule. I'll tell you now that I don't do the mathematical projections, particularly in, in Elliott Wave. Um, I, I think they can be misleading. You can miss moves because of them. I'm more attuned to the price action and looking for where the market is completing its structures rather than, and areas of consolidation, rather than actual mathematical and time projections that, are, that some people use. Um, so we had an almost near 100% base there. Wave two broke out. Wave three extension. Wave four back. Wave five up. And as the, the chart before showed, four, five, and then an ABC correction. So it looks like that. The main rules of Elliott Wave, which you just cannot break these. So wave two cannot retrace back through the wave one high. Uh, sorry, the wave one low in a, in a bull market. Or, or a wave one high in terms of a bear market. Wave three is never the shortest. There's only one pattern when it is, and that's in a diagonal. 
There are far more diagonal firsts that are cropping up, especially in foreign exchange, than we've probably seen. Certainly in the last eight years, they've cropped up a lot more. Um, but generally, you'll see them in, in a fifth wave process and what the, the conventional or um, pattern recognition um, technical technicians will know as a wedge top. Um, and, it, and it generally goes with divergence in the RSI. Wave four, once you're retracing wave three, never crosses back through the top of wave one. So they're pretty simple rules, and they're the only hard and fast rules I use. It's easy when you're in a trending market and you have a wave three breakout and everybody's on it. We've just seen it in the dollar. We've just seen the performance of the hedge funds. And that is one of the easier processes. But you probably get two, maybe three, decent macro trending moves a year. So if you're willing to sit there and do nothing, which some traders can um, do, um, then it's fine. You just wait and hope that you catch those two, move, those two big moves a year and, and make your 10 15% of the actual move and then try and leverage off of that with, with, with um, options. The harder part is the rest of the year, when you're in the correction, correction processes. Now, <clears throat> these are the main corrections. The first one, five waves up, three waves back, and then another five waves up. Looks exactly like the basing structure I just showed of a new trend. So you need to have a reason as to why you think this trend is either over, and you're looking for this to be a third wave up to there. If you think it's a correction, and believe it's a correction, it's because you haven't got a finishing process in the bear trend. And all of this is obviously vice versa for a, for a bull trend and a topping phase. The second one is what we call a flat or a zig, uh, an irregular flat. This can be a little tougher at this point because it can either make a higher low in three or it can make a marginally lower low. And then you get a five-wave rally. A little difficult area, but we've just had one in S&Ps, and I'll show you that as an example. And the easier one, which everybody knows and sees and knows as a flag or a triangle, is five sets of three. Whereas, as an Elliotitian, I have a good chance of picking that point and being able to get in there, and obviously my risk-reward, if I can get in there, is considerably better than having to wait for the breakout of a pattern, because I'm then getting in there, and it can still muck around and come back into the triangle, and that may trigger your stop. So the ultimate risk reward is trying to catch that point at the top. And we'll have a little look at a couple of triangles. So trading with Elliott Wave, you get an initial five wave sequence. And I'm going to work on the basis that we're seeing a, a complete turn in the market. So we've been in a bear market, and this is how we would structure ourselves positionally wise in a new bull phase. We've got a five-wave rally, and ideally it breaks the previous sequence of, of, of lower highs, so you get a little bit of Dow theory in there as well. The pullback is our first buying opportunity. Now, there is no hard and fast rule, as I said, except that it cannot go through that low. So somewhere between here and here, 99.9%, .9%, we want to buy. Equities generally do 100% retracements, when I say equities, I mean equity indices. I don't do a huge amount of, of uh, individual stocks, but I do occasionally look at them, um, especially in, in S&Ps at the moment, where I look at the big five by uh, market cap. Um, but generally, equity indices, more often than other markets, can see 100% retracements. Foreign exchange generally is quite shallow. doesn't even perhaps get to 38%. But again, it's, it's no hard and fast rule. As you need a, a filter in there of, of where to get in on that pullback. The easiest part, once you have wave two and your first buying opportunity, and you can probably use options for that, is when we break through the wave one high. Because that's the point where if you've been in a big bear trend, once you see the move back up through here, the psychology changes. All of the long-term bear holders are in. The guys that were, were trying to stick with the trend and sold the bounce and got down to here, they're still short and thinking this is going to go to new lows. And the psychology behind why a third wave happens, especially on a daily to weekly to monthly time scale, and broader the better on, that, on that, bro that process, is that when you get a third wave and it accelerates, 
You get a fun generally, it's when you get the change in fundamentals. So you have a, a massive shift in the fundamentals. A broad market part of the market is still trapped short from the broader trend. So they have to get out of shorts, and not only are they getting out of shorts, they're wanting to get long. So you get double the amount of flow that's coming through. And I've got a, a, an interesting, if I can remember to, to mention it when we get there, an interesting example when I was going through this with somebody the, the, the other day. And he, he's new to the markets, completely uh, naive about everything in terms of markets. He's literally walked out, out of university. And he said, is how much of technical analysis is self-fulfilling? So I'll, I'll address that. And it was a question that came up. So wave three accelerates away when we believe that wave three is completing. We can reduce our risk. If we've missed everything, maybe you're on holiday or you're away, and you're at this point and you've just walked back in, this is still a great buying opportunity on the fourth wave. I would suggest trying to trade fourth waves on a daily chart. The, the time frame on and risk reward of trading on an hourly or an intraday chart of a fourth wave is, is less than it will be on a daily chart. Um, because you have to have your stop under the wave one high. And it generally is, is give or take a one for one on an intraday chart. So you buy on this pullback. Generally, I would suggest that your fourth wave pullbacks will be around 38%. Not a, again, not a hard and fast rule, but a lot of them are. Um, and a lot of them tend to be triangles or a, a form of, generally shallow. Um, and the point of them is to change that underlying perception of a bull market. You get your fifth wave, you exit your longs, and if you're really aggressive, you can go short. Otherwise, you wait for an A down. If it's a five wave down, you get a, a stronger idea that you can be selling into a B wave bounce, and then you can trade it down to the C wave low, which generally, and this is a pretty good rule, is around the previous fourth wave. And you get that a lot. And then you can start rebuying, but obviously your risk reward <clears throat> if you're now regurgitating your, your underlying trend for a much broader move, you're buying here and your stop has to be down under these levels. So it's not as easy as one, two, three as it seems there. So we'll go through a few walkthroughs and, and how I see it playing out. So a rather flippant comment by Yogi Berra for the Americans in the audience. You'll probably know him, was a rather famous baseball player and coach, but he had a number of sayings that he came out with, <clears throat> which were known as yogiisms, um, and, and there are some good ones. It's not just a good life quote, I think. It's a great one in terms of, of technical analysis and markets. And the market will tell you a lot if you pay attention and just watch it. Um, and it's, it's one of the keys to, for me, in terms of trading with Elliott Wave, is, is it doing what I want it to do? And if it's not, why, and am I wrong? And therefore, should I be reducing risk? So some quick examples. The irregular flat I was talking about. This is um, the S&P future, mini futures. We've just had it. Um, a lot of the uh, market was looking for a top after it double topped around here. For me, as you can see, we were three down, three up, three into here, three down, three back up. That is a very, very clear three-wave process that failed in a new high. And then we had this aggressive flush out of positioning. So for me, down to 1900, it was far more likely to be a correction and that we were still in the underlying, as you know, we've, we've been in a huge bull trend in, in stocks and S&Ps, far beyond anybody's imagination in terms of driven by um, an easy policy and quantitative easing. Um, so the trend for me was very much intact, and I was looking for a last move up in five waves from these lows to somewhere between 2000 and 220. And the market obliged with a very nice five wave structure. So one up to there, two back, and as you can see, that's roughly around 38%. And if I can hold them out, the pointer steady enough. There's a little one, two, three, four, five, if you go down to an hourly chart, ABC back to the previous fourth wave, and off we went again. One, two, three, four, five, and then a broader correction back, and then the final fifth into the top, which that was Friday night up on the top. 
and it was as bid as you could have thought a market could be. And that was Monday morning, and it had collapsed. Now that's telling you something, for me anyway, it's telling me something about the market. One, I'm looking for a five wave to complete. This was clearly a fourth wave by the nature of the depth and size of its correction. Um, so there's a damn good chance that we're coming into a more broader fifth wave up the top. So I was then talking to my clients that I think a top is in place up here, and I think we're going to at least retest somewhere down around these previous lows. I had quite good support for, for one reason or another um, at 1910. Um, and we have, albeit been in a roller coaster this week in S&Ps, as some of you may well know, um, we have been up and down like this between these two, two levels. And I think when you look at some of the other markets, it's looking quite scary in terms of stocks for the coming weeks. So triangles. This is dollar yen. And I've, I've put this one up because it's the first time, I think, in my entire career I've ever seen a foreign exchange market double up on a triangle process, one directly after the other. Gold does it, does it all the time. But foreign exchange, I've never seen it. And there's a rule of alternation. If you get into Elliott Wave and you learn about it a little bit more deeply, there's a rule of alternation that goes on. That If your second wave correction is deep, then your fourth wave correction is shallow, and vice versa. So we had a triangle that was playing out. And we, we actually had three triangles in this process. Um, why did I not think at this point that that was the end of the triangle? Positioning, mostly. I talked to a lot of the hedge fund community. I talked to almost all of the major hedge funds in the world. I generally know a lot of their positioning and their mindset in the markets. You can go and look at the IMM report and see what the positioning is there in terms of CTAs and futures positioning. And you can also get a report on the risk reversals in foreign exchange, which are still massively skewed. I also knew, because I traded a lot of them for them, that their positioning was still long, looking for a move towards 110. And they had a lot of KOs sitting down around under 95. So there was two things for me that's going to happen, because the market just isn't that nice. It was either going to come back down, it was just going to be an A, B, and then a C down to here, and this would chop around, and you'd get a horrible flush out through 95 and do all the KOs. The other way the market can really muck you up is do nothing and decay your options away. And that is exactly what it did. We just went sideways for longer. And another month and a half, generally, ballpark figure, initial human reaction when they put an option on, three months pretty much runs through the time of that process, and it decayed all of them away. And I can tell you this. At that point there, I spoke to every single one of the people that I talked to and said, I think this is now going to break to the top side. Three of them said, actually, I've gone short because I think we're going to test down here because it's gone on for too long. And I had nobody that would do anything with me on the top side until then. And that is where they all flooded in. And hence, you get that dynamic move, which, which is fine. They made some money. But they didn't make anywhere near as much. And you can, you can put some very funky options on in, in foreign exchange to leverage that view. So another point that I thought I'd throw in around Elliott Wave and, and one of the textbooks, if you're, if you're new to technical analysis here, you'll read about RSIs. And if you get below, when they're unwinding, you get below 20 and it's oversold. Above 80, it's overbought. I, I do not use RSIs like that at all. But it's just interesting to note that through all this process and all the correction, the RSI never got anywhere near 20. That was about the closest it got to. Everything else was, was, was much higher. So perhaps one to think about how you want to use RSIs in terms of positioning and getting in and out of the markets. Mutations are when the market really can be a, a bugger uh, and, and throw you out. And, and in the example and the walkthrough that I'll, I'll show you in, in, in relatively real time as best as I can, you can get it wrong. I get it wrong. I don't get everything right, obviously. Um, but you can get mutations in corrections. And this is, this is an interesting 
double aspect of the market here. Um, we have a clear A wave down, a B wave back up, and then a three wave decline back down to here. And there was every reason that you could think that that was the correction over and that we were going to break into trend here again. And I would have been quite bullish at that point and looking for it to extend. But when it broke back through here and failed in this fashion, it was telling me I'm wrong. <coughs> Third waves accelerate. They don't muck around much. They just go, and that's not right. And it ended up mutating itself into doubles. So you can layer those correction phases that I showed you earlier, and it can, uh, it can build itself out into multi-patterns. So you ended up having an A, B, C, and then an X, and then another A, three down, three up. I know it's three down, I know it's three up, it started going down, so I know I'm expecting a five-wave decline. And when I see that five-wave decline finish, I think, OK, my A, B, C process is coming to an end, and I can start to reinitiate risk. Even if I miss all that, I have a very clear five-wave reversal here, three waves back, and then I can buy onto this pullback, and I can get quite aggressive. Buying the wave one break, it broke, came back, tested it, classic technical analysis, and off we went to new highs. The bit where somebody asked me whether it's self-fulfilling, I thought this might be a nice slide to discuss that very quickly as I'm, I'm, I'm pushed on time. Head and shoulders cropped up, and what I thought of head and shoulders. I would suggest, <clears throat> I have no mathematical proof of this, but I would think from observing head and shoulders, 60% of them fail. In the terms of failing to reach the targets that you will read about in a book. So you'll read Adolphus McGee, and he'll say, here's your neckline across, here's your left shoulder, head, right shoulder, breaks it. It should move from the depth of the head to the neckline projected down. So you can really see here the dynamic. And one of the tricks that I use when I see these patterns develop, I love head and shoulders when I have a five-wave decline from the head to the neckline. When I see it develop like this, and I'm pretty sure that the underlying trend is continuing and it's a correction, it's another heads up that I know that there's a faction of the market that sold this neckline break and got short, and you get a little aggressive move down. And they're short on that. This gives me an opportunity. If I see my five finishing, and I believe an ABC is finishing, fin finishing I'm pretty confident that I can get long because they're going to rip out those positions on a move back through the neckline. And this conversation cropped up, and I wanted to drop this in after I'd done the slides, so I would have had a line in. But you can see the neckline there, and you can see the flooding out of positioning as we broke back through. So the mentality had changed on the break of wave one. So outside of those critical levels, can't go through a wave one low or a wave one high, can't overlap in wave four back. I'm not particularly fussy about exact numbers. They do work. You can draw a trend line. They come back. They test the trend line several times, three, four, five times, which is great. But I wouldn't necessarily use exactly that number. Round numbers are um, ones that I avoid as well. And it's amazing how today we still see option structures in foreign exchange. And it's still, oh, I'll do uh, 129.50 and 131.50, or 129.50. 135, and they're all round numbers. Um, I worked at RBC for a time, and I was absolutely, truly amazed around the round numbers, how the collective community of co corporates would put all of their orders around 00 and 50. And you'd, get, you'd look at the order book, and they'd all be collected around there between 05 and 95, or 45 and 55. Um, so I watch Fibonacci clusters. Um, I, I'm, I'm not particularly mindful of absolute Fibonacci levels. I know where they are because I know how day traders react around them. But I'm looking for clusters of, of Fibonacci levels that overlap and provide real levels of support and resistance, channels, and previous congestion zones. But I will give slippage around those levels. There's, um, there's too many times I've been stopped out in early days of having it right behind a level to then just watch it um, fly straight back in the face. And I had this when I was working at Tudor, um, and the trader coach there, I was moaning at one day of being stopped on pretty much the absolute low in S&P one day just to watch it rip back 10 big figures. And he said, well, you do know that the models come in when they 
break to a new low and the volume isn't there and the sectors haven't made enough lows and that's how the models work. So now I keep my stops somewhat further away than where they, where they can kick in and, and force the market back. So a couple of walkthroughs. I, in the words of Tom Keane, if you watch Bloomberg, I'm going to rip up the script and start with what happens when you're wrong and when you're lazy. And this was relatively recently. So I'm going to start with the foreign exchange and why I, why I was, what I was looking at. So this is dollar India, one month forward. We had what I believe was a clear five wave structure and what I believe was a clear A, B wave sideways, we'd broken down and into C. We'd broken down as we came in to an election process. Results were favorable to the economy and it was as expected. And I thought, that's it. For me, we've reached previous fourth wave. Got some divergence kicking in. I can see a wave structure of ABC. What else is there out there that could support this view that we're coming into a base? Sugar, um, I won't go into the intricacies of sugar, but sugar is massive in an Indian diet. Um, and they buy a hell of a lot of it, and they grow a hell of a lot of it. And I called up the sugar chart. And bear in mind, in the backdrop of this, one of the biggest issues in, in India, without dropping into fundamentals, is inflation. And, and food inflation is a, is, a, is a worrying thing for them. And I looked at the sugar chart, and I thought, in my infinite wisdom, that I had a pretty good five-wave structure here, which would at least be an A. And then we had this fantastic triangle. And I tied the two views together, and it seemed a pretty strong case for Dollar India to, to pull back up. And not only that, you had a pretty good opportunity to buy sugar and, and make a move. My projections were somewhere around 20 and a half to 21. So I spoke to a lot of my commodity chums, to which they said, ah, oh, we're all over it. We know about El Nino coming out of Australia. And we know that the rains in India weren't so good, and they're shortfall, and that the sugar harvest isn't going to be great. And we're all positioned for it. And I should have listened more carefully to that, because that's what happened. And I was completely and utterly wrong. And it was pure laziness, a bit of time constraint because of the job that I do. Um, but you need to pay attention. Interestingly, though, my commodity chums weren't very impressed with me, but my foreign exchange guys weren't too upset because it has actually drifted back up. Not a great one to play because of the carry, um, as well you know, but at least it would have got you out at those levels from your longs. So I thought I'd do a proper case study from start to finish, and the Aussie dollar. This is a monthly into July, and I'm going on the basis that we're starting from scratch, and we're now seeing in July 2011. So I've got my monthly chart up. We had a very strong rally from 2000s to 2008. For me, it was a wave A. We had the bust out down in wave B. And then we'd been working a very steady trend of carry supported by ease policy, growth, China, commodities, boom, mining, everything's great. Australia is a great place to invest in and carry. But we got to this point. One of the best rules of Elliott Wave is that when you are in a correction of 535, wave A and wave C quite often are equal in length. So I stuck this up and thought, wonder where wave A and wave, e, uh, wave C will be on equality. So the, the height of that projected up from the bottom of wave B was exactly there. And if you went back through a broader chart to 1974, if your data goes back that far, that was actually a major top. And this level was exactly 61.8% of that move. So it piqued my interest as to a top, a major top, potentially developing in the Aussie and a C wave completing. So I'm now going to go and try and prove if there's more backdrop to this than just one chart and one wave count. Copper. We've already topped 
and we've already started a turning process for me in the markets. And if you're not sure about copper and its relationship with um, Australian dollar, it's pretty damn close. Mostly because it's a big mining community, as well you know. Iron ore is its greatest export, and I didn't have an iron ore chart at the time because China seemed to put pressure on one of the markets that released the China iron ore import chart, perhaps because the whole world now is looking at an iron ore chart and deciding that that is the China economy. Um, so I couldn't put the chart up of iron ore, but it, it's very correlated. So by dro Baltic dry freight, sitting on its lows, no sign of a rally at this point, shipping's poor, is that right when Aussie is trading right up on its highs? So I've got copper declining, I've got iron ore declining, I've got metals generally, especially industrial metals, declining. I've got a potential top in the Aussie, and I've got Baltic dry freight sitting on its lows. I look at the crosses, and I can't go through them all on here, but I generally go through all of the major crosses in this extent. But its nearest trading partner, Aussie Kiwi, we've just triple topped and rejected a new high, so Aussie should be looking to <coughs> underperform the Kiwi. So that's good. What was the dollar doing in general? So this is Euro. My biggest um, view of foreign exchange is that it is contained in a market. And one of the things that David Snedden threw at me yesterday was, I never know where to start with Elliott Wave. And it's one of the ones that you'll probably see in the questions that you'll see. For me, it depends what time frame you're trying to trade as to where you start. You can pick the wave count up at some point that makes sense. For me in foreign exchange, rather than where Elliot himself was looking at a stock market that was forever apart from 1929 to 33 odd, it, it was always building on itself in a bull market phase. Foreign exchange doesn't work like that. It works in threes all over the place. You get big pockets of aggressive five wave moves akin to the move from 98.60 through parity in euro dollar and up to 160. But within that process, the central banks will hold foreign exchange within certain ranges. And everybody's fighting for a weak currency at the moment. So for me, all, it, all I'm looking for in euro dollar are three wave structures all over the place and how those structures can form. So I've just finished a three-wave process, got near the top of the channel I was looking at. Um, it's certainly at a congestion resistance zone coming through here, just below it. We had a, a hard and fast rejection of that. So I've got a potential completing process here, which obviously, for those that trade foreign exchange, this is the DXY as well. Its majority of it is, is euro dollar. So I'll have a look at another dollar eight. We've got cable which has just rejected its major range highs. And again, although I think that that was a five-wave process and a broader correction is happening, I can't get this into being a five-wave process that would see a five, three, five up to 185. It just doesn't look like that. It looked like it potentially here, but not here. It's chopping around and doing nothing. So it's probably going to be another part of the range process. We've rejected that. We've come down, and now we're languishing under the key resistance. So the probability for me is that this is going to go down as well and back into the lower depths of the, of the range. And it's one of its commodity trading partners, Dollar Canada. Whether this count will be right, because this is going back a long way, um, whether this count is right as five waves, it looks a pretty good five-wave structure. But I believe that this was ABC. We had a finishing five-wave process down into here. Huge divergence on this last move as we were getting into the um, speed line that was running along the bottom. So I've got Euro finishing an ABC correction. I've got Cable, which has rejected its major highs and is in a, a, a three-wave process looking set to go back to its channel range lows. And I've got Canada that looks like it's finishing, a, and obviously Canada being a high commodity um, reliant on its, its, its um, economy is also going to be subject to the same stresses of a commodity turnaround as, as, as Aussie dollar. And I've got a basing pattern in here. So how do we trade it off the top? And I'll have to run through this quite quickly. 
This was the top, and I'm, ideally I would have done this in real time, so you're going to have to excuse the hindsight of, of this process that we know what it did. But you had lots of doges and tall tails coming through in the candle chart. Uh, we'll look at vol in a minute. If you didn't even want to have the risk of selling spot at this point, vol had come back and was sitting at its range lows. It's not going to cost much to buy strikes at these two levels. And we did break down very sharply. But it's this bit here that I wanted to do a quick walk through. So if you're sitting at the top, this was the vol chart, just to explain and show graphically that we were sitting at this point, June, July. We're sitting on a very low support in terms of vol. So not only would you have gained from your spot move and gamma, you would have gained from your vol as well. So you're leveraging that, that view with very little risk. I would bet, I can't remember off the top of my head what it would have cost for a, for a, a one month structure, but I would bet that it probably wasn't much more than about 15 basis points. And at the point that you would be buying that back when we broke down, you probably would have made five times that. So managing short-term swings rather quickly. This was the point where we'd broken down, we'd started into a correction. I've got a three-wave move here, so it's an A. Three-wave back, a B. I've seen the market do five waves up, and I know. Three, three, five. Classic correction, textbook, sorted out. You can be aggressive and start to buy some options or, or sell the spot there. Or you can wait for confirmation. We had a nice little breakdown. Made the wave one, had a three wave correction back. I know I can't go through that high and I can set my stops on cash above that high. Now ideally I would have liked to have done this in, in real time and have this bit hidden but I didn't, didn't have time. It was wrong at this point. We've broken back up, and I was stopped out. Probably would have had an average shorting position, just under 105. Let's call it 104 and a half, 104, 75. Stopped out, probably lost 65, 75 ticks. It's mutated itself. This was an A, a B, and then we ended up having another C. I'm absolutely convinced this was a top. I'm still viewing this as correction. I've just mistimed it, which does happen. I then have a very clear five-wave decline and a three-wave pull pullback. I know now that this is my second opportunity to short. I can't go through that high. Wave two, re-entering the shorts, and I can get aggressive on a breakdown through that low. I never got aggressive with the positioning here. I probably would have only done, I tend to think of markets and positioning in units and out of four units. I probably would have only been short two units here and added aggressively on that. So out of the 75 ticks I lost, I lost half of that in real money. Here, it accelerates down, breaks away. Wave three, irregular wave four, so three up, three down, and then five up. And then finally, a fifth wave process down. And you can start to think about taking some money off the table. If you think the trend can really roll, then you can watch price action there. And if it bounces in a corrective fashion, then you can readjust, re-enter. But you're in it, and you can build on that position. A little trick, just to finish off with, pretty much. Why do I look for, or how do I find a fifth wave potential support zone? Take the top. But drop your 38% around the previous fourth wave and leave your entire one-for-one one move at the lower level. So normally, if you're looking for a retracement of that move, you would start there, and you would click at the bottom there, and then it'll drop your retracements in. Reverse engineer it at the time when you're here and you believe a fourth wave's in. Drop your 38% on, and you'll get somewhere near a fifth wave potential projection. And it worked really well in this case. So you're finishing a five wave down. You're getting oversold in your momentum. You're getting some divergence. And you can take some of your risk off. So this is the broader next phase. It then went into a huge choppy process. And just another double example of how to manage risk through there is a skill in itself. And it can be frustrating. But we topped. 
We'd already topped. I tried to overlay these in, in as close as I could. But copper had already broken. And then we had a clear ABC structure. And the market had got bored of its shorts in here. And they decayed away, and they got out. And there you have the aggressive move. And if you're a foreign exchange player, you will know where Aussie is down around these levels now and the, and the structure of, of the dollar and the view. So markets are always changing. Markets are always the same. Pre-2008, I used to look across fixed income, commodities, equities, for, um, and, and foreign exchange. And they correlated nicely. Since 2008 and quantitative easing, that hasn't been the case. I've had to adapt. And it took me probably seven, eight months to realize that that was the case. So I've had to change how I look at the markets. So you need to be aware of what's going on and if things are breaking down and changing. So now I use different relationships and stronger relationships than others. I'll leave you. I'm sure you'll get a printout of the presentation to read Jim Rogers's, Rogers's take of how the world changes as I am running out of time. I read this once. Uh, I can't remember who wrote it. I think it was Connie Brown, who, who I'm a great fan of. And we seem to look at the markets in a very similar way. But I thought this was a great analogy of Elliott Wave. And it's akin to playing the piano. You can teach somebody the notes, and they can learn to play the music. But it's only a few people who can play it that somebody will come and pay to watch and listen to. And there's a rhythm, a harmony, a proportion, and a balance in the markets that you can find, and I find, by using Elliott Wave that helps me get an edge and a probability take on the market. And some people are just wave deaf or wave handicapped and just cannot see it. And there's a little test, I think, that somebody did where you can have a bar or a stick and have a weight on the end. And if you can go and pick up that stick and see where equilibrium is so it balances, you're probably not bad at, at, at a, a proportional way of looking at the markets. If you pick it up and it just drops, you probably just don't have that ability. And it's nothing right or wrong. It's just right brain, left brain side of things. So that is how I look at Elliott Wave. Hopefully, it's, it's a way that you can utilize and take away um, and um, hopefully avoid some of the pitfalls. And, and, and have some success with, with using Elliott Wave to make money in the markets. And I think with that, we'll go to some questions quickly, or, or is it the bar? <laughs> Robin did say that if he ran out of time, he'd take questions in the bar. That was his I, I, I'm very happy to prop up the bar. <laughs> so we might leave that at the moment, because we have run out of time. Um, thank you, Robin. Using or taking another Yogi Berra quote, he, he also said, if you don't know where you're going, you might get someplace. So hopefully, by using Elliott Wave, we'll know where we're going, and we have a rough idea of the place we're going to get to. So thank you very much, Robin. And a small oh, thank you very much.